name is David Harrison. I'm an artist. Um, I'm interested in many things artistically. I live in the Seattle area and have lived in the Northwest most of my life. So how I first got sort of into art, I guess as a young, as a young boy, I, I was kind of singled out as being able to draw. When I was like five or six, and I got a lot of encouragement from my family, other uh, relatives and adults, teachers. So um, yeah, that continued to develop. My mom and grandmother and my brother and I would go to the Oregon coast. You know, that'd be in the 60s when I was pretty young and we'd all paint. And so that was very informative, kind of helped push me along. And, um, but I've had many influences, like most artists, nature being a huge one, but other artists too. The, um, beginning with drawing, but then the first time I really started painting, it was with watercolor. And um, I really focused on watercolor primarily all the way into my, into my 20s. I continue to do that. Um, I experimented with acrylic a little bit when I was in high school, but primarily watercolor for quite a while was my main focus. Yeah, so yeah, after... After high school, yeah, I, I went to an art school for illustration and um, continuing to do watercolor. There's a school in Seattle called the School of Visual Concepts just before computers kind of took over. And uh, yeah, the main teacher, Dick Brown, he was an outstanding illustrator and he mainly used watercolor. And so, um, yeah, so I, I did that quite a bit, but eventually, I, I decided I was not as interested in the commercial side of artwork um, illustration. Although I've done some of that, I really decided I wanted to be more of a fine artist. Then I took a trip to Europe and traveled around for about four months, months and uh, went to numerous um, museums uh, all over the place. But um, let's see, uh, shortly after that, I guess I started painting. I had been working mostly from ideas in my head and working from photos, but then I started going out on location much more, painting watercolor in plain air or on location. And um, that sort of evolved into doing oil painting on location. It's more of a durable medium for that. Somewhere in there, I started doing etchings too through an outfit in the San Juans uh, in kind of northern Washington. Um, mostly landscape kind of imagery. And let's see. Um, but then acrylics have started to come back in um, quite a while ago. I started experimenting a lot more. So I expanded. I'm always trying to go beyond just looking at things, trying to create things out of my imagination more, try to keep pushing myself to stretch more. And I've lately I've stretched myself right off the cliff, so it's kind of hard to know if it's any good anymore. But, uh, as I said earlier, I got a lot of um, encouragement when I was younger, but um, uh, that obviously isn't the main thing. It was my... Uh, there's a certain joy that comes from creating something, especially when you're inventing something. Now, there's a certain satisfaction from being able to render something, but that, uh, that's just as kind of a tool to get there. But I, uh, somewhere along the way, I just really, especially in high school, found a lot of joy from just inventing things. Um, other artists... Um, I mentioned at Cannon Beach in the, on the Oregon coast, there was an artist, Bill Steidel, and did these kind of fantasy, sort of like children's book illustration work that was really inspirational. In high school also, uh, Roger Dean, the artist that did um, the uh, Yes covers, the group Yes, their album covers. But um, I haven't stuck with that thing, but just that when I was painting in those days, it was really satisfying to create something 
um, just to have it show up in front of your face. And also, um, I've just been so moved by nature all the time. I'm just always just totally captivated by nature and other artists too, artists, musicians, everybody. I'm just in awe of what other people have done. So that's kind of all connected, trying to live up to, uh, trying to do something that would be an homage to the people that have uh, really given me um, this creativity. Yeah, well, and then also I could say um, as, an alter as an alternative, a more traditional path, I saw my father um, being kind of pushed around for political reasons. I think he was very competent at what he did, but he kind of politically got shoved around and and um, and so I figured uh, I'd rather, you know, put everything in my in my own power to fail, so I can have my own failures, not have, uh, um, yeah, have somebody else kind of uh, cut me off. So those are probably the main. I'm just I'm, I sort of have this desire always to paint or pick up an instrument and play music. I don't really quite know where that comes from, but I think maybe I've covered the main sources. Was art also a coping mechanism for you? Perhaps uh, when I moved, uh, our family lived in Edmonds, just north of Seattle. Then, right before high school. Uh, we moved down to uh, in, to the Beaverton area outside of Portland, Oregon. And that was kind of traumatic, kind of torn away from all my friends. So um, I was already painting a lot in junior high prior to that. So that carried over. But it uh, coping with moving, yeah, it's, it's a good chance that coping with moving, um, I dug inside more. Um, but there have been a lot of times in the last few decades when I've been maybe struggling with something and I've never really, uh, sought artwork as a way to, to, uh, deal with it. You know, like friends will advise me, why don't you paint a picture? And, uh, and that's, no, it's never been, yeah, I, I can't, I've never, except for high school, I don't think it's really been a coping mechanism as much as uh well more meaning you know however that's connected with life to find meaning in your life um why are we here so it's something i can uh um it, it's funny i've i've said i've never never doubted being an artist except for every morning when i wake up so i have to kind of resurrect my um um maybe like prometheus i have to res resurrect my Dedication, but it's not really hard once they get moving. I'm compelled to be creative. It's kind of my answer to if things are get confusing or um, upsetting, then uh, I go, well, I know what I'm doing with my life. So that, in that sense, I guess that's coping.
you developed several styles of uh, art of working let's talk about these styles they are very different styles um i could start off the whole thing by saying uh, yes i have all these different styles but what i have really been searching for and probably still haven't really found is my own personal style my thing that's identifiable. Um, maybe I'll go the whole, my whole life and never quite find it. Uh, and I don't know if that means I'm hmm, too uh, greedy, arrogantly wanting to do everything and not being disciplined enough, or maybe it means I'm just interested in a lot of things. I don't know. I know some of my favorite musicians, Miles Davis, you know, he always talked about having one specific this you know have really cultivating your style and so felonious monk is a real wow he's one of a kind but so in, you know with artists too you know you look at a jackson pollock painting and you go well i know who that is yeah i think i think he was kind of limited though after a while i think he got really he could only do so many of those and then he drove his car into a tree so uh um, but anyway, my different styles, I guess starting with just drawing and then um, trying to render things and uh, invent things too. So you're kind of gaining control of your coordination, eye to hand thing. And then, um, and then painting when I was younger, I did a lot of, uh, when I was in high school, I did a lot of, like I said earlier, a lot of uh, sort of inventing things. So, yeah, you kind of, there are no rules then. You're kind of just doing what you want. But then, I guess when I was looking at making a living, I started to try to cultivate being able to really render things. And this is really good skills to have. But like I said, that eventually that kind is not enough. But so I, I did start to... Uh, I worked a lot from photo, from photographs, and um, and we tried to just really get good at rendering and interpreting things. I tried to, you know, not just totally make it like a photo. The times there were times where I really did um, get sucked into that. Um, but so a lot of that, and then eventually, that was mostly with watercolor. Then I I needed more, wanted more. So um, I kind of all along, I kept trying to push the inventing imagery thing as opposed to just looking at something and responding. So um, <clears throat> that continued all along. I'm trying to think of the chron chronology. I think um, somewhere in there, yeah, I did start to go out on location more. And, um, and so then if you're painting, say a watercolor or an oil, eventually turned into painting oils but what if you're going to paint on location and you're going to finish a painting um i figured you have about four hours to do it and the idea is how can you succinctly render something in that time so you have to come up with a language to do that and of course a lot of it has to do with what you choose to paint in that context in the landscape genre um there's, a, there's an artist I really enjoy is uh, Russell Chatham. He passed away a few years ago, but he's a Montana landscape painter. And uh, most of the things he would do are quite a ways away. So it has a lot to do with this space or the atmosphere between here and over there. As soon as things get closer, there's a lot more detail. And you have to figure out how you're going to translate that. So one way to do that is don't do it. Just do stuff that's way over there but anyway so landscape painting a lot of that and then um yeah this like i said that turned into oil painting on location i haven't done a lot of that in the last few years um but i have done some yeah more or less kind of impressionistic like that kind of style um i'm eager to do more of that but um Acrylics, um, there was a whole other thing that developed here maybe maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago in the 90s. 
late 90s, I started, I did a lot of work for Nordstrom stores and I was using acrylic, but, but then I, um, um, since I had done etchings, or use, I was using a stylus to get these lines like a pen. And so I wanted to get acrylic paint in a, I wanted to get a line so I, I would mix up acrylic paint with medium and use squeeze bottles like for ketchup or mustard. And then I could, um, you know, thick enough that it wouldn't drip out, but thin enough that I could squeeze it out. And um, yeah, here, I'll show you one of these. Yeah, here's kind of, this is a bigger one than I would use, but um, this, might, this might be a little bit too thin, but you, I could just squeeze this out but draw lines right on a, uh, a surface with that. So I was usually, with that experimentation, I was trying to come up with, uh, um, yeah, invent different things. So all, all these different things have kind of intertwined, but I guess it was in the, in the um, right around the year 2000, late 90s, I started... Um, in the Magnolia area of Seattle, when I was doing my uh, plein air landscape painting, I mainly was painting these madrona trees. But then I, that kind of evolved into taking the madrona tree kind of uh, subject matter and um, sort of inventing my own madrona trees and then trying to come up with a sort of a language of Again, how you would interpret all that vegetation if you are close enough where you have all that detail. And so, yeah, squirt, squirting out the paint um, was one way to do that. I got pretty influenced by Aboriginal artists and all those kind of patterns they would make. And uh, sometimes I got too, too influenced. You know, you don't want to pra uh, plagiarize, but I think I maybe started to. Um, but so yeah, that squirting out paint became uh, a big deal. I did other kind of imagery of um, um, like city sort of scapes. I called them neighborhoods, sort of uh, more uh, ge geometric lines and things, lines and then textiles. So with squirting out the line, it kind of looks like yarn. So um, yeah, it would get kind of that effect. So textiles were influential also. So I'm still trying to explore that. Um, there's kind of a painting behind me that was the one where I squirted out the lines, but then I just sort of filled in all the, the shapes that were created with um, acrylic thinned down like watercolor. But for the most part, I come back in and, and just squirt the paint in and make patterns with, within things. Lately, I've been, uh, since I moved to this town, Paulsbo, just outside of Seattle, to be a caregiver for my mother, alongside my brother, um, I've been able to experiment even more. So I've been dealing with um, um, acrylics horizontally, um, getting it... Um, quite liquid or not as thin as water, but real liquid. So where I have this kind of little rail around the totally level painting and I'm squirting out paint um, using gloss and matte medium against each other and uh, lots of experimenting, lots of failures. I've had some successes with that. So that's a whole new thing I'm doing. I don't quite know if I'm done with that or not. So so let's see, I've covered watercolors, drawing watercolors, I guess etchings were in there for a while, intaglio prints, but um, primarily watercolor and then oil painting and then acrylics, but covering um, kind of a fantasy invention kind of thing, representational artwork um, from photos. I've not done that in a long time, but then, um, the plain air painting thing with either watercolor or mostly oil in the last 20, 25 years. And then acrylic. I've not taken acrylic on location, but uh, lots of, you know, experimenting with the acrylics in my studio. So those are the main styles, mediums and styles. So I'm kind of schizophrenic 
were you also doing design? Were you a designer as well? No, I'm not a designer in the sense you're using it. You know, I try to introduce design into my paintings. Uh, but no, I'm not, I'm not a designer. No, the work I did for Nordstrom and, and other people has, has come through uh, just to amazing connections. I think, um, I think it starts with once you commit to doing something, well, there's a quote, I can't quite remember, but once you commit all these things, uh, the universe starts to align. Uh, it's kind of heavy duty on the spiritual level plane, but um, you start planting seeds, and one of those is that you're committed to this, and so I'd make a certain connection over here, and that would lead to something over here. And, uh, of course, if you make a painting and somebody sees it, that's a pretty direct connection there. But so if I were to explain how I got connected with Nordstrom, who, who ended up, I did quite a few, I think it's almost 400 paintings for him. And, um, but it started with me um, um, through a friend. I met these guys that opened a gallery and then to promote a show I had at that gallery. I went around Seattle to different designers and people just trying to promote myself. I met a woman, uh, Patty Lynch, who had this little showroom. But then she had a friend who was a designer who worked with Nordstrom. And so Patty got me a lot of work through this, uh, this connection. Then my connection with Patty kind of went away. And then I was out painting on location in Magnolia, as I said earlier. And uh, this woman who I had met through, d where I delivered my paintings for Nordstrom, saw me out there, came out and said, oh, you should get a hold of Karen at Nordstrom. So I did. And that led to me doing a whole nother, uh, I don't know, over 100 landscape paintings, mostly uh, for stores in the um, West and Southwest. But um, let's see. So the Hawaii deal recently with the Hyatt Hotel, I had, um, again, in Magnolia, back in Seattle area, I had participated in a uh, little open house kind of show, and I met uh, a woman, Holly Norris, who is a designer, in Magnolia and through her, well, I don't know, these connections just go on and on. So she was dealing with, and her daughter uh, were dealing with this um, big company uh, in uh, Seattle, MG2, I think is the name, that was doing the remodel of the Hyatt Hotel. And uh, so they actually purchased one of these experiments, the big flow flat paintings, and then they commissioned me to do another one. It took me a bunch to get one. Uh, I, did a, I did 14 of them and uh, submitted seven of them. And they selected one. But yeah, anyway, so these connections, um, I could give another one really quickly. I uh, went to meet some friends back in the, must have been around the early 90s at a, a, a bar in... Um, you know, restaurant bar in uh, in Seattle. I was meeting two friends and their uh, wives. So um, I'm in that place around Christmas time, and I was noticing a really nice watercolor. And this uh, the manager came up and started talking to me, and I let him know that I was an artist. And that led to me doing six paintings for their restaurant there. But then the other people in this big building started hiring me. So I did paintings not only for that restaurant, for other restaurants, and then for other people, and then there. So I had paintings all throughout that building that all came from going to have drinks with somebody. So, uh, so that kind of is about the connections. Um, things like that keep happening. It's, it's amazing. If you commit, I think it's if you just really commit to something, you never know what's going on. Like right now, maybe somebody is, Right now, somebody's looking at one of your videos and, you know, it's reaching out to you right now. Somebody, maybe he's looking at a painting and I'll get a call. So, of course, you want to 
promote yourself. So I have my website. And um, if I can, I've been in galleries before, but this issue of me being too spread out is a real problem. Galleries want to see one thing in particular. So I'm trying to solve that. I suppose when uh, when I look at nature, I'm I'm pretty sensitive to color, and so um, I'm always trying to break it down um, into how I would paint it. Uh, but um, uh, I guess there are different palettes that I'll see in nature or maybe experimenting or even other work I've seen where I really like the choice of colors and how they interact. 
I would say nature is the biggest influence, but I mentioned that artist Russell Chatham earlier, and um, I've heard him described as a tonalist painter uh, because a lot of times these are real kind of moody paintings of the real even, um, real even palette, like it has a filter over it almost, where there's a a color that's warmer and a color that's cooler, but they're very close together where your eye kind of sees that real, that nuance difference. So I've always liked that. And, and then, yeah, Russell Chatham's paintings have that more of a earth tone thing. But I know that in some of the work of mine, um, earth tones, uh, some textiles, there's um, the African uh, Cuba cloth coming from uh, the Congo, I think. Um, the textiles made from, uh, I think it's from palm bronze. Anyway, anyway, there's this, it's just a real natural earth tone kind of palette. I've always liked that. And um, in some more recent paintings, these ones I've done here, here in this, uh, where I'm at now, um, as, as far as the palette goes, um, there is this uh, Fort Warden up in uh, Port Townsend, a, um, uh, a location on Puget Sound here, just north of me, north of Seattle. And um, it was one of three forts that kind of protected the inlet to, um, to Puget Sound. But they, uh, it was built 100 years ago or more. So they had these giant iron doors on these uh, kind of bunkers and uh, maybe where they stored ammunition. But the iron doors had rusted and gotten all these this incredible uh, colors. And then somebody had put graffiti on it and then somebody else had come along and painted over that. So and that was quite a while ago. So they're like these abstract paintings, but the palette of those a lot of these kind of turquoisey colors and greens and rust. And so that's been real influential. Um, uh, bark, lately, bark has been really influential to me. There are these trees not far from where I live, a deciduous tree where once they get up close, the bark has these really uh, incredible kind of warm tones. Um, kind of hard to describe. I want to paint it. Uh, um, so things like that, maybe that kind of answers. I'll get triggered by things in my environment or tr triggered by just, um, just starting to paint something. Um, I think, um, the fundamental palette is the three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. And so, um, sometimes it's fun to just have a purple and a yellow and just get those nuanced colors in between, but try to really keep it simple. So, and all those beautiful grays that come from mixing complementary colors. So that's another kind of way to get um, a palette. Where does your music come in? Because I have a feeling that your art, your painting, needs your music somewhere. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, music. Well, I took piano lessons when I was real young, but I certainly wasn't any kind of a child prodigy. I didn't get anywhere near the encouragement I in music as I did in, uh, in drawing when I was young. But, um, um, I think it was in high school where I started going, I want to learn more about music. And of course, the more you listen to music, the more you're, uh, I mean, I'm kind of driven. It's so incredible. Um, I think the first music book I got was a sheet music to uh, George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. But, you know, I was always a big Beatles fan. But so I tried to go through there and, learn the music, learn, try to just learn, educate myself. I really didn't, I knew a few things, 
but so I've started just wanting to learn and learn. So I'm mostly self-taught. And I've had friends that have helped me along the way. Something in me has wanted to make my own music, though. So uh, that's where, you know, you kind of have to learn an instrument somehow, at least at a certain level, and um, learn more about how m music's put together. Um, so I think a big, I don't know what it is. Um, I get so influenced by so many different musicians. So I already mentioned maybe uh, Miles and Thelonious Monk. I think, I think Duke Ellington's my favorite, but that's really hard to say because I love the Beatles and um, Stravinsky. It just go, the list goes on and on. I could list people just on and on. Um, I love Brazilian music, Jobim. So um, something in me wants to learn that. So I want to learn that basso rhythm. And then I want to, uh, I'm just compelled to do that. There's probably not enough time to master so many different things. But there is kind of a, um, one kind of influence is the other. And I think I'm primarily a painter. I think next I love to compose, but then performing the music I can do just enough with these really good horn players or other people to maybe be able to accompany somebody but then after a while I think I would uh, I would hire somebody to play my compositions not enough time to be good at all of them but um, um, it, it is kind of funny I saw an interview with Chrissy Hine from uh, The Pretenders and she mentioned that she paints. So, and she pictured her heroes like Van Gogh or some of those, those guys as being in rock bands. If they live today, they'd be in a rock band. So I thought that was funny. Van Gogh, maybe a singer, what would he be doing? Drummer? Um, so, um, so I'm trying to balance that all these. Um, I've, I've, pay, I've gotten paid to play music. Um, you know, uh, a fair amount. So I've made money doing that. I haven't sold my compositions. I've never really tried yet to put them out there. So the main thing economically has been the painting. But um, yeah, so my friend, uh, friends, various friends, but recently my friend Philip Orozco, who's a sa great saxophone player, he and I have played at... Um, um, a local winery at their wine tastings until COVID hit. We would be playing there pretty much every weekend in the summer. And um, um, we've done weddings, that kind of thing, gallery openings. So, um, yeah, so I sometimes I'll be painting and then I'll need a break. So I'll pick up my guitar and maybe, you know, go through a song or something. Um, but I'm usually always going, okay, time to get back to painting. So that's kind of the interface there a little bit. Your mother is a talented singer and her talent did influence you to become the artist you are today. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, so um, so my mother, yeah, so I, I moved here uh, about six and a half years ago to my uh, parents' home. My father passed away the, um, actually the day I moved over here. He was in a, in a memory care facility um, already. He'd been there a couple of years, but my mom, my brother had been living here, but he said, I need help. Mom is kind of losing it. She was developing dementia. She has pretty full-blown Alzheimer's now, and was, that's why I moved over here. But, yeah, in the past, um, yeah, she was a great singer. I wish we only have, like, one or two recordings of her, which is kind of a tragedy. But she was, had a fabulous voice, and, um, and we would paint together a lot. 
Um, so um, through the years, for decades, um, my mom and I, when we get together, we would play music. We'd sing songs, mostly her singing. And I play the guitar, the piano, and we go through all kinds of material. So we love um, American songbooks, so Cole Porter, G George Gershwin, that kind of stuff. My mom loves the Beatles, so we do Beatle tunes and uh, um, big band music. Duke Ellington, of course, uh, was a huge one. And um, so, yeah, that's, that was very influential. When I was over here uh, at the beginning, I was playing the piano and we were going through the songs we'd normally do and Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me, the Duke Ellington tune was one my mom actually taught me. We had it, I had the sheet music and I had never heard it. So I played the chords and she sang it. So and that's an incredible song. And, um, uh, but so that was one we'd always do. But so I remember sitting down at the piano, maybe after I'd been here a year or two and we we're about to play that song. And um, at that point, I had to kind of point to where we were in the music so she'd follow my finger. And then I'd have to turn the page. So I'd you know, play the piano with my right hand and do that. Good exercise. But um, there was a point to where that just did not register to her at all. It just was gone. So for my mom, hearing music from the past, me playing it or somebody else, that's completely gone. She's not connected to that whatsoever. Um, many people tell me that's the one thing people can remember or hold on to, but not in my mom's case. However, you know, after I got through you know, sobbing a little bit, I realized my mom was singing something completely different. She was... in composing right there making up i was going i've never heard that before and she's just um maybe words a little bit but mainly uh just notes and that led to a good two two full years maybe a little longer of her just singing so she couldn't really communicate anymore but when she wanted to express something she would just start singing it was like a musical she just sort of burst into song, but, but it'd be, you know, these melodies going all over the place. So I would, I've recorded a ton of them. So maybe there's some compositions to be had there, but um, I would try to follow her. So I would, she would sing a line and then I would try to sing it back. But then meanwhile, she continues to sing. So it kind of overlaps, you know, like the row, row, row your boat deal. Uh, and um, um, and then sometimes I just hold one note, like a pedal point, and then she would sing, you know, if I've kind of found the key or something. And then other times I'd, I'd be following her, and then we, I would just, I'd have my head right next to hers, and she'd start to, I would be, I would be trying to just see if our minds could be one. And, um, and sometimes it's remarkable. She'd be saying something, and I would, actually go to the notes that she was going to maybe maybe 30 percent of the time we'd actually hit the same note at the same time so i don't know if we were really connecting mm -hmm. but there was that and well now that i'm talking about my mom there's um so she can't really understand when you ask her a question or sometimes it's hard to say but she started saying all these um, things that are like poetry to me. So I'll read some to you. Um, so I, I could ask her some question, and this would come out of the blue. Do we know if she heard what I asked or not? Um, I don't know. Or sometimes there wouldn't even be a question. And she would say things like, the first fern before the silent sounds to me like uh, directions to this place in the woods or don't turn on the walls well that was walking down the hall so i think she was talking about the lights or something um i i have fingers in mexico i named that painting behind me based on that um standing above the deep and again sometimes you just come out of the blue um pig dog top with one face so 
Um, I named a song after that, a, a composition I made, but boy, does that sound like some lyrics. And somewhere else you said Wonder Pop. Yeah, yeah. Pig Dog Top, Wonder Pop. It sounds like John Lennon lyrics or Langston Hughes poetry, something. Um, yeah, well, so at night I'll put her to bed and say, I love you. And, and one time she looked right at me and said, you're a sifter, East Tacky with heavy arm. And you know, with that look from a mom, like she believes in me. So I'm a sifter. So I've tried, you know, I, it's like poetry to me. Um, another one of these at another time, there's a cold, cold between the words. With my mind, I die. Before the soup cake comes, the birch lady and the wonderful wandage. Around your neck name. So a necklace and nickname and neck name. Or I, you know, that's the, so anyway, there's that. Uh, now that I'm on that, my mom's. So this is kind of gone also, but she used to. Um, I don't know if you can see this. But she used to uh, draw a lot. You know, we painted together, but then when she had this full-blown Alzheimer's, I would give her these uh, pens, uh, water-soluble pens. I don't know if you can see some of this stuff. But so she would draw, and I would draw, and then, um, I'm trying to get this where you can see, and, uh, and then she'd start folding the pages over. And so that became a whole thing where we'd fold it over and then I'd start doing that and then it'd be, it'd be create like this book um, and then another thing she would do maybe you can see here she kind of bore through there there's sort of a hole here where she um, would be just focused on one area so much and I had gotten the paper wet because these are water soluble pens and she just bore right through it and just keep going through page after page. So, that, so it's like a book where this page is connected to the next page to the next one. So we would do this together. Um, and uh, it's like a storybook, sort of. Um, yeah, these things folded and you could open them up even more. Um, it just kind of goes on and on. Hopefully you can see it a little bit. But so that, I guess that's me and my mom interacting on that level. So um, uh, the mom, like the mom I once knew is gone, but this is the new mom. So things change. But I guess that's enough of that show so but this is also gone the singing is pretty much gone by now and um and the artwork's pretty much gone we have a great caregiver that's gotten her to uh to do a little more um artwork but not a tremendous amount so she's still my mom's still happy she'll be 92 in a couple months but um it's been a real education to, to, you know, accept this change in her. And then also, um, uh, well, it, it seems like it's some creativity is wanting to come out there still. So I've got lots more of these lines that my mom has said that I might convert into lyrics or something. But I have many pages of those and probably have over a couple hundred recordings of her, these melodies she's made up. It's just incredible. So that's my mom. So we, we've shared a lot of music and art through the years. Like I said, in the 60s when her mom, my grandmother, both my grandmothers from my parents, each parent um, were very creative and musical and but uh yeah going to the oregon coast with my uh, mom's mom my grandmother and my mom and my brother that was very informative but um 
and then painting through the years and singing. Um, I guess another family connection is my, um, I think it's my great, great grandfather was a cartoonist for the uh, Oregonian in Portland, Oregon. Gee, back in the roughly a hundred years ago, somewhere in there, maybe a little later. But that's my family connections. So you go back generations. Yeah, I, yeah, I suppose, you know, a lot of, oh, gee, my, my, uh, well, you know, a lot of people have, have talents and uh, things like that, but, you know, um, some people aren't comfortable, I don't know how to put it, without making me sound like I'm somehow better, but, um, um, it's, you've got to be up, you got to be able to handle the uncertainty of what's ahead. If you're going to be an artist, you don't know when the money's coming normally. So you have to believe in yourself that you're in the process of attracting that or manifesting it somehow. And, uh, but yeah, so I, there's talent, you know, I've seen talent in other you know, definitely in other family members and people, various people, but, um, yeah, it's that commitment. You really have to sign. You know, I guess I made a promise to myself that I'm an artist, uh, or that's what I'm going to do with my life. When I was really young, um, I just seemed like that's what I'm going to do. But so I see, yeah, again, I see other people that have, lots of talent but they it's it's um i guess some people don't want to pay the price to do that and it's understandable <laughs> so i i haven't had a family i've tried i've tried to get married a few times mm, and that's a long way to put it i've had relationships but um i've never gotten married and i've always wanted that but um I didn't have the money in the past to raise a family, so that could have been one reason when I was younger. You did, you do blend uh, genes and qualities and talents from both sides, both music and uh, illustration and arts and painting. Um, you have enhanced sensibility only in a way you're doing art therapy with your mother for her i'm doing you're saying maybe i'm doing art therapy for her yes yeah because i'm saying certainly in that case that certainly is art therapy for me to be able to do that with her but yeah i uh wow i'm a little i'm a little upset with myself that i wouldn't think of it that way I mean, I did at one point, but when it seemed like it was gone, maybe I should have persisted more. So I'm going to now. Um, I'll continue to sing with my mom, but um, I mean, just sing to her, you know. Uh, and actually, she's taught me just to sit and make up a melody right on the spot. Just try, you know, just whip it out. Um, but but the art, yeah, I think I should should try. I mean, our caregiver, like I said, that comes in and helps. She's done that, so. It's just not it's not nearly as um doesn't seem to be as much there anymore, but maybe I can help her get it out. She's gotten more tired and she's smaller now, you know, getting thinner. She'll like I said, she'll be ninety two. But yeah, so art therapy. Maybe uh, maybe we can make another one of these books. See if I can get her to do that with me. I think what happened is I was doing most of it towards the end.
I think primarily what you're seeing there is uh, more of these um, kind of squeeze bottles. Um, here's, here's a smaller one. Let's see if we can get that. Yeah. Okay, there we go. There's a smaller one. So if I found something here, I'll squirt it on my Miles Davis quotes. Um, I can, here's where I can kind of squirt out a line. And maybe you can see what I did. I don't know. I'll get that where you can see it. No, you can't quite see it. Mm -hmm. It kind of shows you how I can make a line with that. And um, but yeah, so that's that's the acrylic thing. That was just acrylic paint mixed with matte medium. And then I do the same thing with uh, gloss medium, but I have it thinned down a lot more. And um, yeah, so they're different viscosity. So I have these squeeze bottles and I can change the viscosity. If I want that uh, bolder line, I can use the um, thicker viscosity. And then when I want it to flow more, I start thinning it down with water and medium. So either gloss or matte medium. And some of what, <clears throat> some of what I've experimented with um, lately has been... Um, um, squirting out gloss field and then coming back into it with this matte, uh, these matte passages and it creates some interesting textures and things. So I don't know where I'm at on that, Ex experimenting. But so, okay, so that's the acrylic thing. Um, the bigger brush actually, that bigger brush over there I actually use for, for varnishing over. That's like a varnish brush. So I did, uh, about a month ago, over the summer, I did a uh, commission of uh, some landscape paintings for um, a friend of mine. And um, so I use that to varnish it once it's dry. Um, those were oil paintings. So I have my French easel. Um, I can grab that and show you. Anybody that's, uh, you know, paints probably have seen one of these before so that opens up with these legs or you can um, set it up with the legs show you. and uh, that's for painting on location um, behind me you can see I kind of have a, a wall easel that I can put a painting on there and paint if it's vertical I have another one to my left here uh, that's oil painting, um, and then I do have watercolors, but I haven't used those in quite a while. But I keep, I try to stock up on supplies all the time. So I get money, I just buy supplies. So I have too many supplies, but I don't want to run out. So I have lots of canvas, rolls of canvas, and um, the main thing I'm doing now is the acrylic thing. So some variation on uh, the gloss and the mat and squirting it out. That's what I'm going to keep pushing for now. But so that's the materials there. That's on canvas. So I'm mainly working this size, four feet square. And um, um, the uh, painting on location is smaller sizes. That's normally what's done there. But I haven't done that in a long time. Um, I've gone to Hawaii um, 
a few times and made a really good friend, Mark Brown, on, uh, on Oahu, who is a plein air painter. So I kind of, he keeps inviting me to come over. So we, he's visited me over here in Seattle, but um, I go, like to go over there and paint on location. But uh, that's, yeah, again, oil painting. But even discussing this makes me want to try to do acrylics on location. And I kind of mm, want to do some watercolors again for the first time in a long time. So those are the main mediums. Oh, I also bought a lot of uh, oil pastels. I haven't really used them yet, but I'm eager to. What else can I say? Oh, well, sometimes with the acrylic, um, I've painted on board, just like MDF board. Not that done that so much lately, but on my site, my website, I have some paintings that are three foot square where they were pretty much all done on, on board. But um, so, so with watercolor, it's paper, um, acrylic board and, um, and canvas. Same thing with oil board or canvas. So I also have lots of brushes for the more traditional way of painting. I'll use brushes. I've never really gotten into palette knives. So um, um, mainly just when I'm playing air painting, I'll use brushes. Um, I could say that with watercolor, I started to, um, it's been a while. It's been a while since I've done it, but I started to really get into uh, using these, um, I don't know if you can see it against my shirt, um, Japanese or Asian brushes, um, Sumi kind of brushes, I think. Uh, this one has sizing in it still, so it's still nice and hard. But, um, but yeah, so then I'll paint uh, basically like this. On a, if I had the paper right here, you know, I'd be painting in this kind of a, away so um, you can get big wash kind of things but but you're using the tip um, I'm a member of the Northwest Watercolor Society and one time uh, actually a relative of mine who got me into that group um, Richard Singer he had he had arranged for a, a man from China to come give a talk and he talked about um, I think primarily with the Sumi tradition where you don't want to, you want to be standing up and you don't want to let like your elbow hit anything because then the energy from your um, soul or whatever, is, it would go into the table. You want it to all come out the end of the brush. So I thought that was really profound. And then also the fact you're standing, you can kind of, um, I like to stand when I work. Sometimes I'll sit down if it's kind of a long-winded thing, but um, I usually like to stand. So, um, and I know I've st um, stood up a lot of my life because friends of mine that are the same height that had jobs, I mean, when we were younger, that had jobs where they sit, they're not as tall as I am. They've shrunk kind of. But, um, but anyway, so standing up, getting your whole body kind of rhythmically in there. And of course, you know, I guess that ties into music, dancing, moving your body. Um, so, um, yeah, now I want to watercolor paint with those again. I'm, I've, I've made big, uh, acrylic paintings, uh, in high school is when I first was using acrylic. And in that case, I was using acrylic like watercolor on canvas, not with these brushes, but, um, you know, other bigger brushes. I would, I would do these big giant, um, just lots of water, let it dry, and then I'd come back into it and try to find things, like almost like looking at the clouds and saying, you know, I see a dinosaur or a whatever, rabbit. But so, yeah, as a, as a technique, yeah, I really like that idea of um, uh, standing up, getting your body into it more.
Uh, well, my, spiritually speaking, well, I practice Buddhism, so Nishram Buddhism, but um, there's always room for improvement on that one, too. <laughs> uh, but so creating value with my life, that's, but a long time ago, uh, my mom, who, who I adore and think is just the kindest person I've ever met, not just to me. Um, I remember one time my brother was upset because we'd just eaten a lamb and he didn't like the idea of this creature being eaten. So um, uh, he was talking to my mom about that. And then I asked my mom, well, what happened to that? lamb once it died and she said that's it my mom's a pretty i think she probably would have called herself a christian but her answer to that was when you die that's it nothing well uh i think i was about four when i heard that and and it was that the void of absolute nothing uh was kind of horrifying but it also made me think at that young age that my life was going to be this certain length of time and not very long. So I decided, uh, well, that had a lot to do with me deciding I want to paint. What do I want to do when I, while I'm here? Um, um, and now I think of saying, uh, nothing, uh, well, no thing. Um, so you die, there's no thing, there's no more material, but then of course, um, what, what continues on spiritually, what energy continues beyond the material. So there is no thing, no more things, but. Uh, I suppose unless you reincarnate. Anyway, so I think that uh, in Buddhism and in general, I think you need, no, not need. I'll just say that for me, looking at death uh, real closely has a lot to do with me wanting to do what I'm doing. I think, yeah, I think you want to look at death. You're going to be, you're going to be dead someday. And so, well, what's the, uh, I don't know who said it, but basically, um, when you get to the end of the of your life, we won't regret what we've done, and we'll regret what we didn't do. Or, so I always feel like there's more. In fact, I constantly feel like I'm not living up to my potential. Constantly, it's really kind of a nemesis. There's probably some good in there, but anyway. So from a meaning standpoint. Um, Sometimes, well, it seems, I'm just looking outside at nature. It seems, uh, it seems like nature and just my appreciation or something for nature is, is so real that I want to, I believe in connecting to that. It's just really powerful. That I'm certain that that's real and powerful in a, in a good place. So I, I picture... When I look back, sometimes I can picture, uh, I try not to look back, but um, there were, uh, I think of all the times that I've been standing out. That's not a bad way to spend your time out in nature, just observing it and react, responding to it, reacting. So I've done a lot of trips. I used to have a van. I'd travel around and go places and paint. But uh, from a meaning standpoint, well, and I mentioned other artists too. Like I can't listen to the Firebird Suite by Stravinsky. If I really listen to it by myself, I'm, I'm totally in tears at the end of that. It's so magnificent. And so I think, I think of all these other artists, artists that have moved me so much. I mean, I'm just, I'm just in awe of what our fellow human beings can do. I'm just. I'm so grateful, and I just somehow want to try to give back on that level. You know, I, you know, I, mm, yeah, well, I don't know if I'm at 
whatever level I'm at. I'm just trying to give in the same way that I'm just looking at all my CDs and um, all these people that, that have just blown me away. And then nature too. So um, that's kind of what, when I get all worried about everything or uptight about whatever, that seems like the place to go that, that's uh, real. Well, and then, you know, the Buddhism I practice, um, Herbie Hancock, the jazz piano player, he's also a member of Wayne Schroeder. But he, he would say, before he's a jazz musician, he's a human being. I guess being a good human being first, so helping my mom, I think maybe since I never had children, I finally had to grow up in some ways. Uh, my time is really truncated now, so I'm always feeling like I'm behind. But it's an honor to help my mom. So I probably the biggest thing I ever did in my life was helping my mom at this time. So, yeah, try to lean, aim towards the good and not the bad, which is in every one of us. <laughs> so maybe that answers. With Buddhism... We learn how to live in the moment, to appreciate the present and be in the moment. You seem to live a very mindful uh, life where you live in the moment, you help you know, people around you. However, how do you take care of yourself? Well, I quit poisoning myself with alcohol when I moved over here um, in more ways than one. That certainly gets in the way. Um, I exercise. So I, I run um, five miles every other day. I eat really well. We eat salads over here. We had a really... Uh, we had a successful garden this year, so eating lots of fresh vegetables. Um, I try to get good rest. Um, uh, I went with a, uh, I went on a hike to the uh, Washington coast in April with a friend, um, lifelong friend I met when I was one. He was two. He likes to say he was twice as old as me when we met. Ron, yes. Yeah, so that that was good. But um, I had a couple other hiking trips this summer planned to get away up in the mountains. But they both kind of blew up. I won't go into why. But I think now I think uh, my brother and I have this fabulous relationship. So we probably wouldn't be able to do this if we weren't doing it together. So we, we disagree sometimes, but um, yeah, yeah. It's, so we, we celebrate, I, I celebrate a lot of the time uh, how lucky we are that we can do this and actually work together. So part of, uh, you know, part of Buddhism is looking at yourself. Uh, Buddha means to you, awakened one um so you're trying to see your thoughts and you know really own what's going on so that's a big part of um i mean own how you're processing everything your beliefs so even recently uh yeah people advise if you're a caregiver you should um you need to get a break get out and uh my brother just got out on a solo trip up the whole river valley in the Olympic Peninsula around here. And uh, he's done, he did that a year ago. So that was for his sort of, you know, mental health. Um, but when I went out in April, I'm in better shape than my brother. He kind of hurt his back. So I just don't think I'm getting away like that. But, but, uh, for many years, my brother would say um, he doesn't need to get out like that. He needs to raise his life condition through his Buddhist practice. So 
I think that's more where I'm at now is I need to just continue to breathe and be more uh, uh, at peace, you know, within and uh, to try to see myself more. There's, there's times, uh, well, I read a lot. I read a lot. That's one way. With COVID in particular, I've always read, but then I just kind of have gone nuts reading. So I've just been covering a lot of the ancient Greek uh, philosophers and playwrights and uh, uh, but many, many other things too. Philosophers in particular, psychologists, Carl Jung. And, but um, that kind of helps me uh, seeing my place in the world and, you know, just um, trying to find more peace there. So, yeah, I go for walks, you know, and try to just breathe and stop thinking so much. Ha uh, ha. <laughs> Like Eckhart Tolle would advise. Um, but that's like you mentioned, being in the moment, trying to just be. I Boy, there's a ton, tons of more work to be done on that one. But I, I, I try to do that a lot, just breathe and, and stop, slow down my thinking. And I've been able to see myself more and more as time's gone on. I, there's way more work to do. But uh, about a month ago, I... Um, I had this epiphany that that uh, I really am the source of the negativity and doubts and anxiety I've had. Some of the anxiety of, of uh, going into the uncertain future is, you know, I'm willing to tolerate that because I keep trying to go someplace new. But some anxieties that are just, it's like a, this entity that's trying to ruin ruin my life. The darkness that I believe is in all of us. So I, I've always thought it's this thing that kind of visits me. But about a month ago, I realized it's me. I'm doing it to myself, or, or I'm at least responsible. So getting a handle on that darkness, I think it was Solzhenitsyn that said that the line between good and evil cuts right through every human heart, something like that. And so... You know, we have this, I have this darkness in me that's generated by me. That's the real epiphany. It's, it's not coming from, well, I don't know, I'm sure people would disagree with this, but it's not like some devil over there that's coming in and possessing me. No, it's already in here, and I need to see it and deal with it. Uh, so those kinds, that kind of work to look at myself closer like that's, helped a lot to take care of me uh, doing the caregiving thing and just in general, being sober, you know, that's when you just start doing the work. Well, here I'm going to switch seats with my brother, Dan. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dan. Do I need an attorney? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yes, my name is Dan Harrison. Um, I'm David Harrison's brother. I live in Paulsbo, Washington. You have known David your entire life. So there's no one better than you. Of course, your mother, but you know, she, she cannot talk for him right now. That's but right. you can. Please. Give me your perspective. From your perspective, how did David evolve as an artist over the decades? That's a big question. Um, both when we were both younger, we both kind of, uh, I guess, demonstrated some artistic capabilities and interests uh, very young. I don't know, it's like, I can't even go back that far in my mind. Very young though, we both were. And uh, uh, I guess I'd have to say that Dave, um, I kind of tended to drift away from it, whereas Dave stuck to it. And uh, it, it was something that, um, you know, uh, in school and stuff like that, that uh, whenever there was uh, 
work that was, if you will, art oriented or something like that, he always excelled because that was his proclivity. He was very attracted to art. And um, so I would say that, I'm kind of guessing, but I would say probably by the time he was 12 or 13, I think he was pretty clear that that's what he wanted to do with his life. And uh, from that point on, I mean, he's had some diversions, but it's always, that's always been his prime directive, if you will. Um, and uh, so, I mean, everything that, since he made that decision, that's what he wanted to do with his life. And again, uh, that's probably, he would only could answer the exact time, but it was very young. Probably out of the ordinary for somebody to establish that. Um, but nonetheless, he did. And and once he kind of decided that that's what he's going to do with his life, I uh, elected to support him as best I could. And boy, has he. I mean, Theo Van Gogh, eat your heart out. So, I mean, I, could, I don't know if I can get more detail if that's what you need or does that kind of answer your question? Yes. You also share um, the caregiving. Yes. That's true. And uh, we've, uh, yeah, circumstances have a way of uh, affecting decisions we make in life. And, and uh, I don't know how much he shared with you, but there was a point in time where uh, he was involved in relationships, but had no official studio, his own space, working in garages and rooms and stuff like that, you know, and never an official studio. And so um, I had purchased a piece of property in Seattle that was uh, a small home, but there was room on the property to actually build some kind of a studio. So I, at that point in time, I suggested he move in and um, we built him a studio. And uh, huh, I, I had no idea. I was kind of uh, didn't expect the situation to go on for as long as it did, but we've, we found common cause my pursuits and his pursuits. So we lived together for quite a long time. And um, as a result of that, we learned how to work together. And maybe somewhat unusual for brothers because there was a time when we were younger where we kind of drifted apart. Uh, high school for me, junior high for my brother, where we didn't spend that much time together. But as it turns out, we... Um, we got we, we reestablished our relationship down in Oregon when we moved to Oregon as a family and and uh, we kind of thrown into that situation and I think uh, from that experience we we started learning that the benefits of working together for a common cause than against each other and so of all the human beings on the planet he's the only one I really have that relationship with where we can have common cause and uh, so. Uh, taking care of him was an easy decision to make with him because I knew who I was dealing with. And if there's anybody I was going to make this uh, vow, I guess, to take care of my mother with him, it would be him. That, that's, uh, uh, I think, without, and it actually raises the question, if he wasn't around, I don't know clearly that I would, could or want to try to take care of my mother because it's emotionally and psychologically very challenging. I also believe that I'm seeing how well you have been raised by your mother yeah. because you <laughs> both worked together, compromised and sacrificed, you know, yeah. so many other things to take care of her and also take care of each other. That's correct. We, we, there's no way that... Um, we went through the experience with our father of Alzheimer's and uh, the situation living here with him and my mother became in intolerable for, for my mother. So we had to put him in a facility and uh, it was the, it was just a damned if you do, damned if you don't, but it was the best decision we could make at the time. And uh, my, our mother had expressed that she never wanted to end up in one of those places after seeing our father there, we can kind of understand why. Um, I don't think anybody wants to end up in a nursing home. They'd rather live in their own home. 
So anyway, with our mother, uh, we, we knew that we would not survive her being in a nursing home. It would have destroyed us both. So w there was only one choice to make, and that was to make the decision to take care of her together. We were both in the position to do that, too, yeah. not having families of our own. And, yep. And, and, our, and our dad was terrific, too, as far as raising us. Yep. You know? He was a great father. No, no parents are perfect, but we are really lucky to have two great parents, you know, and, so that's huge. I have to say that you do display a high degree of empathy in, no, in talking about your mother, your father, about each other. Uh, I have rarely seen that. No, well, it was real. It still is real. Our mom. Yeah, it was probably, probably the name. Our, our mom was a big driver because, you know. I had two, but our mom, yeah. It was our mother. For me, I'm sure it was for Dave the same thing, that we, you know, when we come home from school, it was our mom who was there. So when we had any kind of, like, difficult experiences in school, which is, you know, obviously kids go through that, our mother was there to help us work through it. And so, you know, I, I, I think that that was, like, creating the foundations of how I would live my life. Our father would, was a traveling salesman, and he would, you know, be gone maybe for a week or two, but they come back to the family. And so he was not uh, constantly there when we came home from school. But boy, I'll tell you, when he came home, we had to give the full report of what's going on with our lives. And so he was always directly involved in it. And we'd uh, have, like, every night at dinner, you know, we'd have these dinners. My dad would lecture us and, and we'd have these discussions that would go on and on. And then my friends would come over and he would, engage with them he would be asking people questions and and yeah. and just engage with all the people in the neighborhood the kids in particular i think he sometimes he knew more about the kids in the neighborhood than their own parents because he was very um interested in their welfare how do you see the future uh being together and working closely together Oh, well, I can't wait to get away, away from Dan. <laughs> no, no, I think uh, you mean maybe after my mom is gone. So we'll, we'll probably be processing that loss. Uh, we've already done a lot of that processing, but we've, we've, uh, from my standpoint, we've kicked around different ideas about what might happen, but I, I think we've, we've just kind of we're waiting till my mom goes before um, making any decisions there. I don't know. Dan might have a different well, response. If, if it's possible, I'd like to just say one thing that um, uh, some of this stuff is how life unfolds is, but at least appears not in our control. Um, when I came over here, to help my father and mother, um, it was 10 years ago this October, and I was only going to be here six months to try to help them figure out what kind of retirement place they were going to go to. And um, I had, because of a business, uh, I opened up my own business and uh, I ran aground and I ended up losing my home and I had no place to live. David was kind enough to let me stay in his apartment for a short period of time, but we realized pretty quickly that wasn't going to work very well. So, you know, I came over here to, to kind of help him. And, and uh, I had, at, at that point in time, I had one year of sobriety. And I do believe firmly that um, having the obligation of, of taking care and helping someone else directly is what has kept me sober. So, I'm very conscious of the fact that my, my alcohol abuse that got me in a lot of trouble, a lot of suffering cut from it, was a very selfish thing that I was doing, and I simply couldn't see it. And then taking care of my mother, um, and helping that, in that with Dave, uh, it, the thing that it concerns me the most is, is that when she's gone, Almost like, do I need to replace that? That's something that I'm, I'm uh, responsible to. So that's probably the biggest question in my mind.
well, kind of the, the basic principle that an artist should keep growing and stretching and going to someplace new and not just settling for what you've done before, kind of pushing, trying to stretch out and push beyond. And so I guess it's only, it's kind of only natural that, that uh, eventually abstracting things more and more would be the result. Uh, it's, it's interesting because you see a lot of abstract paintings that look the same, but some seem to have real power to them. But many things, you know, a lot of things I've done just are like uh, just another, well, what, what a fellow artist of mine called blob paintings. So, uh, but yeah, it's based on trying to just um, uh, push the boundaries and go, try to just expand myself try to find, you know, mine the potential in me. But I think I might have said earlier, you can, you can go so far pushing yourself that you just go right off a cliff. And, uh, and as I've gone, as I push the parameters, I've also kind of left behind my uh, sort of um, historical sense of what's good or bad. I, it's like, wow, I've left everything behind. So I'm really out here. Uh, sort of naked, which was the idea. And, and so s some of the paintings that are more abstracted, um, it's funny, regardless of the type of work, um, I can be painting it and have a certain objective in mind. And if I haven't, I never realized the exact objective. And so a lot of times I'll not really like what I've done as the doer, and then maybe months later or less time, I'll look at it and I'm no longer the doer, now I'm more of the seer, and it's totally different. But so when it comes to the abstract paintings, um, some of the ones I've done, I was going, wow, that just, it doesn't impress me. But then later on I go, well, maybe that's more powerful than I thought. Um, so yeah, I'm, that's, that's the main, reason I, I kind of went the abstract way is trying to stretch and grow more. How do you find that your style changed compared to the time when you were, you know, <laughs> not sober, but still productive? Well, yeah, and I, I, um, I certainly painted a lot of paintings when I was drinking. Not very many when I was completely you know obliterated um but it did get to the point i can say where well when you're younger it doesn't seem that harmless and i certainly didn't drink every time i painted most of the time i was i, I wouldn't do anything when i was painting but uh yeah, it crept in i would drink more but it got to the point at some point maybe 20 years ago where i if I had been drinking when I did a painting, the next day I'd burn it. I couldn't own it. It didn't feel like it was me. So I already knew that that was interfering. But um, I would say over here, having that removed, um, perhaps, well, and other issues maybe my brother mentioned, well, I have this space here, a nice space to work. And then taking care of my mom, I have this, some of the overhead covered so I don't have to be so concerned about some of that but I think I would like to think that having alcohol out of there I've been able to be more courageous more courageous than go right off the cliff so maybe maybe if I was uh drinking I wouldn't be so so um I don't know it's it is kind of funny because I can there's a lot of times where I'm going, I just, I do these things and I feel really, they're like a performance to do the painting. And I feel really good about the fact that I really courageously plowed ahead, but that doesn't mean it's a good painting. So, but I think the courage to try to really look, well, the other spiritual things we talked about, because it all, that all becomes one at, at some point. So trying to really see myself and see what I truly believe and what maybe what I'm truly wants to come out of me in the way of a more authentic expression. I'd like to believe that having alcohol out of the way is improving that. 
Dan, when David is working in his studio, do you do you come in? Are you involved directly or indirectly? I try not to be. Sometimes he asks me for an opinion when he's been working on something, and I try to give him an objective opinion. But it's it's extraordinarily difficult because we do have different tastes. So, um, but maybe he's just trying to bounce it off getting an opinion from somebody. So um, I, I really uh, often, um, I get more involved with uh, not questions about specifically about a piece of work as uh, the process, because it gets, it can get very technical. And so there's uh, these paintings that he's been working on where he's using the paint wet, so to speak. I guess there's a name for how he does it, but um, there's a whole bunch of, it's almost like a core of engineers project of, of liquid dynamics and viscosities and things. I was explaining. Yeah. yeah so, um, and, you know, I have some experience in, in construction and so forth, and some of these things transfer over. So, a lot of times, my it's more like just trying to solve problems uh, he encounters in the process, and uh, you know that. As far as his motivations of what he wants to paint and stuff like that, you know, I just I, I don't feel qualified to really comment on the direction to go. I'm I'm more inclined to uh, try and encourage him to uh, take risks, I guess. It's, it's uh, uh, that, you know, the risk taking and the alcohol are directly related, you know, trying to deal with your, I guess, your inner darkness, your doubts, your fears and all that stuff. We all have those. And, and uh, you know, so just because somebody's sober doesn't mean they're winning that inner battle yet. Uh, that's, you know, something that continues to go on. And so, but, you know, it's, it's actually the, the challenges that we take on are a means to uh, work through those issues. So, um Anyway, that's why I kind of see my support for him. Le Leanna, I could say that, yeah, I, I hit my brother all the time with uh, what probably is more like you just said, psychological, even spiritual, philosophical things. So we will discuss logistics once in a while, like, like uh, dams for this paint or things like that. But a lot of the time, I'll... I'll just, my brother is the greatest listener, so I'll just start talking about what I'm going through, and then I'll try to explain it to him, and then all of a sudden I'll be able to see it more clearly because I, he allowed me to try to articulate it. And then he'll make comments back, and then I'll realize I didn't explain it quite clearly enough to myself and to him. So I put him through that on a routine basis. This... Uh, uh, soundboard kind of uh, thing. But then we discuss philosophical and spiritual things all the time, which are, for me, oftentimes directly related to painting. It's interesting that you and Dan are different. There are in so many ways. Also, you had similar experiences in terms of your journey with alcohol and then your journey with sobriety. And then in time, this will evolve into your journey with maybe, you know, grief because your mother will not be around anymore. You built bridges between you two and between you and your mother and between you and all these extraneous um, factors in your life, you know, alcohol, sobriety, and other things. You have accomplished so much together. It's a nice, really nice compliment, because I, yeah, we really celebrate it. We, yeah, we, I, one of the things I love is, if it takes one person an hour, it takes two people 20 minutes. So you gain you gain when you can work with somebody. It's kind of a simplification, but we always really have celebrated that for years, how we can work together. And there was a time when uh, uh, my mom had what we call like a super fund uh, event in the bathroom. 
where it's a mess everywhere. You can probably get the picture. And it was late at night this one time, but we both started laughing because it was so, it was so chaotic that, you know, where we could have gotten angry with each other over a really difficult kind of thing when you're really tired, but we usually start laughing and trying to make it funny. You know, David, you may have not found the woman per se, but you do possess a profound knowledge of the quintessence of femininity. So in a way, you did find the woman. I say it's me? Uh, yeah, well, I, I take that as a compliment. So, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm good with my masculinity and I can, I can take the feminine compliment too. Do you have any projects coming up or are you planning anything? Uh, yeah, the biggest project lately has been doing this video with you. So I actually, I'm wondering, I'm hoping that you have your, your voice and comments on the video. Um, but anyway, um, so the music thing, you know, um, tried a lot to, worked on the music a lot this last couple of weeks. Um, but so I'm, you know, a little eager to wrap that up and get back to painting. So for me, um, I had various projects that I, um, that kind of took me through the summer, but now I'm, I am eager to get back to some of the painting things. Maybe those wet, like my brother said, those flowing kind of paintings. There's some more experimenting I want to do there. And then I do have uh, this whole, uh, based on squirting out the paint with um, these, I have this whole drawing kind of, uh, um, I don't know how to define it, um, technique, sort of vision, where playing with the contours of, um, if you draw, let's see if I can explain this simply. Um, if you draw the contour of a shape, um, the line is designating where that thing is that you just defined, but it's also designating what it isn't negative space. So I've been playing with the idea that, that when you, you're using a line, you're drawing something on the left that's positive and something on the right that's positive. And I don't really know which one's which until I go to paint it. So that's a lot of what I did in this painting behind me. Maybe I sent you a photo of that. But that's something I'm, I'm think, I think that's what I want to pursue more is that, um, you know, uh, well, that kind of vision but it's it's a little tricky because as much as i want my style body of work it's easy to just do the same painting over and over again so um i'm hoping i can find sort of a something within that sort of way of playing with those contours that way they can cover a, a broad range so that's kind of the thing that's i'm eager to get back to so a week after next um, a week from now, I'll really dig in on that. Dan mentioned that he's doing some construction work. And I was wondering if Dan is doing um, easels for you or, you know, if he's building, if he's building yes. things for you. Yes, Dan's not doing the construction anymore, but, but I'm answering for him. But yes. There are countless things that Dan has has built for me, you know, a, very, a variety of just things of that nature, including we both built this studio building I'm in, or we kind of uh, refurbished kind of a shed that was here, remodeled it. But that, and then, um, yeah, there are numerous things through the years that I, there are too many to even list that... Um, ways of carrying paintings, storing paintings, easel kind of setups. Not, he didn't really, it's not made of an official easel like the one I showed earlier, but, but similar things like that. Tons, things like that. Ever since I was a little kid. That's right. They made me a little art box like this when we were just children. Looks to 
me that Dan was an introvert and David was an extrovert. That's correct. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, that's funny, but uh, people, have told me, people have told me that maybe in Dan's case, but I could swear when I was younger, I was incredibly shy and introverted. But maybe, I don't know. I know there was a point to where I got tired of uh, being afraid of talking to people. I, I said, I've had enough of this, especially women I was attracted to. I'm, I said, I'm done with this shy business. But so I guess maybe that sort of forced me to be more extroverted. So which means that you were actually a covert extrovert and then you became an open extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fair, yeah, that's fair. I, I psychologically said I've had enough with this. I don't want to be like this anymore. Being shy all the time. Arts do require a support network. Yeah, well, it certainly comes in handy, and yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 um, I'm always trying to be as independent as I can and not be a burden on others. So I don't really, you know, like, like from, you know, you know, the government or whatever. I, I seldom, you know, seek those kinds of, that kind of help, although I can see the value in it. But there's no question that I've had um, numerous people, my brother, my family, but then other friends too, people that have gone out of their way to help me. Just, you know, it's, I'm just, I'm so grateful for that. So yes, I've, I've, I've had so many people that have, that have helped me uh, in, in an informal, you know, private basis. They, They've done things to support me, uh, buying paintings for me or giving me art supplies. So, several times when people, you know, somebody has died, I've inherited lots of art supplies because people will think of me, oh, David could use these. So, so I've got supplies here. Yeah, I've been, I've been supported by a lot of friends and people that really appreciate the arts. So I'm lucky. Thank you.